Okay, uh, welcome back everyone to this uh, post lunch uh, session. And again, in this session, we'll have two talks. Uh, the first one is by Professor Nostansi Burma, and he's going to tell us about biased random walks in random media, drift and trapping effects. Thank you. Thanks. Are you okay? Yeah, okay, thank you. Good. So, you know, uh, especially since this is a meeting, you know, with Deepak Dhar as its focus, I thought I'd talk about some work which we started many years ago. So the dates are here, 1980s, but uh, it's had a revival. You know, the revival has not led to a publication, nor, com nor is it complete, but I will talk about it also. So anyway, so this work goes back to the 80s, uh, started with Deepak. Then I went to Cornell for a couple of years on sabbatical, and there, there was a young student named Steve White, who's now become quite well known in, you know, uh, what, what's a density matrix and normalization loop and so on. So we did some work on this problem. Uh, continued with Ram Ramaswamy, who was then at, for some time at TIFR, but uh, also later. And uh, then there was a break. And then after all these decades, the problem had a revival of, of sorts and we began to work on it again. So, so Jaisal uh, was a visiting student at TIFR Hyderabad and Chandrasekhar is a visiting student at TIFR Hyderabad. So, so let me tell you about the problem. Okay, I hope I go in the right direction. Yeah. So just to get some broad motivation. We are discussing transport in a random medium. Think about a rock. You know, there are channels that go through rocks occasionally. And uh, we're thinking of transport uh, in a field. So the field could be like gravity. So imagine a pollen grain in, in the middle of a rock, I mean, some forest rock, or some, something. You know, you see this particle there. Uh, and it's trying to fall. And one would think that, you know, uh, in order to go from up to down, you can help it along by having a field like gravity, but actually it doesn't always help. So this is the whole point of the talk that the bias, so I'm going to model this as a biased random walk. The bias does lead to drift but it also leads to another effect, namely trapping. And that's very easy to see because this, this thing wanders off into, let's say this uh, uh, region here. Um, it's pushed by the field and then it has an awfully hard time getting back to the main highway or the backbone which will take it down again. So there's at least a competition between drift and trapping. And the, uh, conse the consequence is sort of interesting because the, str the field is very strong. The trapping becomes very, very strong and wins out. So very large fields, there's no transport. For instance, if you imagine an infinite field, it's clear there's no transport because once it comes here, then it can't get out. That's it, story over. Okay, but if the field is not infinite, but large, what would happen? Well, it's still very slow and slow enough to stop a regular drift velocity. We'll see. Okay, I'm jumping far ahead by telling you all this, but never mind. Okay, so we are in fact going to find that the trapping effects kill the velocity if the field is strong. Okay, how do we model the random medium? Well, uh, through percolation. But percolation above PC, this is not critical percolation or anything. So you have a regular old infinite cluster, you know, with certainly lots of a network of paths going from up to down, and you have branches, and you might have backbends and so on. And we want to just study this problem. Okay, so how shall we do it? Well, so here is the cluster. We'll put a particle on it, and we'll put on a bias random walk with hopping rates which are W, that's a rate, and G, small g is a dimensionless number between zero and one. So small g equal to zero, 
will mean no preference between up and downs, diffusive. And g equal to one will mean no possibility of going backward, the infinite field. Okay, so this is the problem we took up. All right. I don't have to point there. Eh? Okay, let's see. All right, so. Uh, yeah, so just to highlight the, uh, you know, the traps, here's a larger uh, picture made by Chandrasekhar, and he's just pointing out, and it's pointed out here, that in this, there are two types of traps. One is that the particle coming along might wander off into this sort of dead end branch, and then it has to get itself back, and that takes time. On the other hand, even if you took your infinite cluster and you had the, all the branches and you stripped them off, then you have the bare backbone. Even then, there are occasionally places where the potential energy is the minimum, like this here. So if a particle comes along sort of merrily and comes here, it will have a little hard time active, going across. So there are these two types of branches. Um, traps, and they actually have slightly different effects, broadly similar, but not exactly. All right, so, uh, so let's go ahead and directly try to uh, model the effects. So one thing one can do is, of course, think about the full percolation cluster. That's very complicated. And if you want to abstract, suppose you want to abstract the essence of the problem and put it on a yet simpler random medium. Here is one. It's called the random comb. And you can imagine a comb. Now you have a comb, it has a you know straight thing, and then it has these teeth that you comb with, but the teeth are random in length. So these are random. And uh, uh, the probability that we have a branch, let's call it, rather than tooth of a comb, of depth L will take to be exponential in exponentially distributed. This is, of course, motivated by the situation in percolation, where above PC, uh, the two-point correlation function, which is, of course, just the probability that two points belong to the same finite cluster, uh, decays exponentially. Now, a branch is not a finite cluster, but it's basically a finite cluster attached at one point to the backbone. So this makes sense that it should be exponential. Anyway, in this model, we take it to be exponential. Now, you see immediately why this trapping effect is so strong. Because if it goes off into a branch like this, and it has come back, it has to activate against the field. There's an activation process. Activation processes are slow and you know uh, typically Kramer's form e to the v over kt, but v will be mg times l. You know that's the pot potential energy you have to overcome in order to uh, go across. So it, it's exponentially large in l, and um, there is of course a length scale I've put in here. Put in here, I could have written e to the mg l over kt, but it's nicer to think in terms of an effect. Length, you can define that in terms of the bias in this way. And uh, uh, so then you can immediately say there are two lengths in the problem. One is the psi, which determines how many branches there are which are long. And the second is this L of G, which tells you how long you have to take to get back. Now, the simplifying feature, of course, is that in any branch, the current is zero in steady state. So in steady state, it's therefore very easy to figure out the time, in a sense. And it allow, so this fact allows you to easily compute the density in any branch in steady state, okay, in terms of the density along the backbone. Okay, so that is clear. So the fact is that two exponentials compete, right? One is Lg and one is psi, and it turns out this this ratio mu, which is Lg over psi, plays a crucial role in everything that happens after this. So let's imagine we have a very long backbone with capital N sites, long but let's say at the moment finite. But okay, we can take it to be infinite later, and we ask for the mean transit time uh, taken to cover this 
um, stretch. Well, so there are two averages involved, of course, because this is a disordered system. So we do the disorder average last, and the disorder average, okay, notation may be slightly non standard, is the angular average, and the bar is the temporal average. Okay. Anyway, so this is what it is. And uh, well, so in any one realization, what you realize is that in steady state, if you want to find the transit time, that's given by the total number of particles in the system divided by the current. This is true. I mean, you figured it out. Good uh, problem in case you don't know it. Yeah, so th this is what we use because it's easy to find the steady state uh, density. We can find the, and we know the current once we know the density. But the current, of course, flows only along the backbone, and then we can solve, and this is the answer. The drift velocity is here. Okay. It's non zero if mu, this ratio, is bigger than one, and it's zero if it's less than. So this is the answer. So either you will either find it trivial or impossible. I mean, it can't be true. Yeah. And uh, of course, if we sent our paper for publication, both referees took the latter point of view. Can't be true, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, for whatever reason, the paper got published, and uh, and we think it's true. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, so th this is a very strong effect, right? Uh, the drift velocity, of course, rises linearly. There's a G that helps it. This is linear response regime. But as the bias increases, it goes up and then down, and then just stays zero. Of course, it doesn't mean that when it's zero that the particle doesn't move. It moves along the backbone, but slowly. So the time taken to move a distance R, or, or the distance moved in time T, does not scale proportional to T goes like t to some power, which is in fact one over mu. That's a mu. Yeah, okay. So yeah, one way you can think of this also is in terms of a random trap model with a release time, right? Uh, which is of this sort. So anyway, this is the uh, result. And uh, well, I don't want to go through the whole history. The, there were papers in print which said that this can't be right because after all, you know, Drift velocity times density is the current, and the current is finite, and the density on the backbone is finite. So we, but the whole point is you have to take the right density, yeah, into account. Okay. Anyway, we'll go ahead. So this was well established, and of course the other thing that happens, and that we studied in some detail more recently with Jessel, is that as you change the bias. You know, there is this regime where the velocity goes to zero, but before that, there is a regime where the velocity is finite, but you have anomalous fluctuations. It's a failure of the central limit theory. <coughs> you know, the law of large numbers breaks down when the velocity is zero. The law of large numbers is valid for a larger, re you know, region in parameter space than uh, the uh, central limit theorem. And, Indeed, you can identify uh, that breakdown with this ratio becoming two rather than one. So the velocity is non-zero here, but the central limit theorem stops breaking, uh, stops, stops working here, and so you get very large fluctuations, more than normal. I mean, they don't scale the way they should, and in fact, this is a very dramatic effect, as you can see. The, the, these are. Uh, uh, um, you know, uh, three examples of uh, things in the three regimes. So what, what am I plotting here? This is distance. This is the probability of reaching somewhere. And uh, over many realizations, oops, what did I do? Yeah. And uh, um, so th this is like normal transport. Uh, it has actually moved about 6,000 units finite velocity. Uh, this is zero velocity state, and this is the in-between states. You can see it's sort of slowly moving, but it's really very anomalously 
spread out, and the same thing in time. Okay. Uh, well, so you can go ahead and try to calculate this um, uh, spread in the sigma squared in the region that it is not zero. Now, to calculate this is not as simple. We can't use that steady state argument that we used, which, you know, uh, for the um, uh, dense, uh, for, for calculating the drift velocity, but you have to do a slightly more involved calculation, but can be done. Uh, namely, look at, you know, the excursions into branches and look at a renewal process of, of a sort, which uh, comes in branch by branch and uh, look at the net effect and the net effect is so you can you get a closed form answer for the sigma squared, which I've not displayed here. But the main result is that indeed, uh, uh, if uh, mu is uh, bigger than two, you still have a normal, uh, maybe I have it the wrong way around. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. I think this is the right way around. And uh, it's anomalously large spread uh, with sigma equal to infinity if uh, the mu is on the wrong side of two. Okay, so th these are sort of sketches of the behavior of uh, drift velocity and one over sigma squared uh, scaled here. Okay, so this is a. Uh, uh, fine. Now, the, both the velocity and the inverse sigma go to zero continuously at the transition, but do they always? So that depends on the distribution of uh, branch lengths. I had taken it to be exponential, but there's a recent paper, more recent paper by Demarel and Christian Wells, which points out that if there's a small correction to the exponential in terms of a power law in the denominator like this one over L plus L over lambda not to some power lambda, then depending on the value of lambda, the transition may be second order or first order. And this is quite easy to demonstrate. Uh, I mean, it's essentially what happens is that at the transition point, the, this exponential in some sense cancels with that growing other exponential which was e to the L over LG that goes away. And it's a question of whether um, the, uh, you know, series uh, converges to a finite value or infinite depending on the, la on lambda. So the drift velocity actually vanishes continuously if lambda is one and shows a first order jump if lambda is bigger than one. And then here are some curves which, uh, to this, right. Okay, so likewise for sigma squared, that happens at an earlier value of bias, but again, it either jumps to infinity or goes diverges in a smooth way. All right. So this is all summarized in a um, diagram of this sort. So here is mu going from zero to infinity. Uh, this is mu equal to infinity corresponds to diffusion. Here's mu equal to two, one, and strongly localized. And as a function of lambda, so there are different regions of second and first order transition. So that's basically all I'll say. I think now there's one more thing I'd like to say uh, about the random comb before I leave this. And that, that there have been more recently several extensions that people have looked at. And the extensions have all been along the lines of, you know, trapping is bad. So how can we get rid of trapping, roughly speaking? So uh, again, that same paper of uh, uh, Demarel and Mays uh, points out that if you have periodic driving, then you don't get trapped, which is periodic meaning the <coughs> sign of the field reverse. So then particles rush out and you know get back. Uh, you could have resetting in the normal uh, stat max sense that we talk about. There's a re uh, recent uh, work by Sarkar and Shamik Gupta on you know particles being reset to the backbone, and then of course again you lose trapping. Uh, 
uh, Argo, to somewhere in the audience, is investigating what happens if you have run and tumble particles in this random medium, in this sort of random medium. And uh, of course, things have a larger chance of escaping. And it, calculation is not complete. And finally, there's a, an interaction which limits trapping and which is uh, actually very important. And that is just the steric force between particles. Because if you think about it, what happened is that you had a long branch. And since the particles so far were non-interacting, they just lots of them piled up in that branch. That can't happen if you have a size of a particle. So then things will not pile up so much. And uh, you might think that, uh, you know, things will be better. This means there are 14 minutes left, right? It is on time. The once before in ICTS, I thought I finished 14 minutes. So I have a long time. So just to confirm. Okay. All right. Okay. I guess I'm doing okay. Yeah. So we are going to actually uh, spend the rest of the time, 14 minutes, on discussing the exclusion process, if you like, in this random medium and you know on percolation and then in this some, some of these random media let's see what happens okay uh okay yeah perhaps uh okay before i come to uh, hardcore particles let me just point out that you know remember we had the other sort of trap namely a back bend which could also inhibit motion up to down because you had to go up backward. And that, if you imagine, you know, a path that goes like this, and just stretch it out. Then it becomes a one dimensional problem with easy directions and uh, difficult directions, easy, hard, easy, hard. Okay. And uh, things can move easily as this is a potential energy minimum. And so is this and so on. And uh, so, this is mimicking one single path along the infinite cluster, which uh, has many backbends in it. And you can take this problem and actually work out the solution. So when Deepak and I did our original work, we worked this out also. But it turns out around the same time, Derrida also, Bernard Derrida also did the, the same problem. And uh, once again, the drift velocity is not monotonic, it goes to zero, and it goes to zero at a certain critical value of GC, which depends on the fraction of green and red bonds. So I hope the model is clear in more green bonds than red. And so there's an overall downward movement, but on the way you have to overcome some potential value. Okay, so this was the model. But now let me move to hardcore. Oh. Exclusion. So some things are pretty clear at the outset, right? I mean, and so let, let's just think about them before getting into any formalism. Okay, so the hardcore particles will uh, move. Of course, they're moving diagonally up and down, but uh, but this can move into a hole if there's an empty hole, and if it's the wrong way around, the it can move, but at a reduced rate. And these are disallowed. Nothing happens. So what will happen? So all these particles are coming in. Let's say we have a reservoir of particles. And so we just supply them from the top. And uh, they're coming in and they'll go into a branch. So if you have a long branch, there will be one particle that goes in, the second particle that goes in, so on. So the branch will more or less fill up. There'll be some gap depending on parameters. But basically, the big long branches will be screened out. There will be no big long branches. So trapping due to branches will go away, right? So they fill up and particles on the backbone see screen branches for the most part. Once in a while, there could be a branch which is empty and there goes the particle and have a hard time getting out. On the other hand, the backbends will not get screened out. Okay, so imagine you have this bagman and you have a steady stream of particles, they have to get out. 
Okay. Will they manage? Of course, they'll manage, but it will take time. So to study that, we actually looked at this problem, Ram Ramaswamy and me, at some point, uh, where we are trying to force a current through a stretch, but the wrong way around. The field is this way. And it's, the current is being forced by boundary conditions. So we insist that the particle on the left, because a steady stream of particles coming. And now this has to climb up. And the moment it climbs up, it goes away. So the boundary conditions are one and zero at the ends, but the field is downward. So you have to activate. Yes. About branches, I was just trying to understand that picture. Yeah. I mean, you don't actually know a priori what is a branch and what isn't. You're wandering through, right? And uh, so, I mean, they're up to some scale, anything that's substantially smaller than that scale is a branch. Uh, a side branch. But uh, so, it, doesn't it depend a bit on the distribution of branch size? Yes, it, it does. But uh, typically, all if you look at the depth of any point and ask in, if it belongs to a branch and ask how far is it from the backbone, that decays exponentially. I mean, that probability of having a deep or uh, something. So branches on the whole points in a branch are uh, distributed exponentially. I see. Okay. I mean, because correlation lengths decay exponentially. This is a particular sort of two-point correlation. Okay. Right. But we are back to backbends at the moment. So we are trying to force this current through now. So the particles uh, are. There. But what is the profile of particles in the backbend? It turns out the particles climb up halfway and more or less stop. It's exactly halfway because you have particle. Let's imagine that we have this boundary condition of one and zero. You have full, full particle hole symmetry in the backbend. So, you know, the whole process is either particles moving this way or holes moving that way. There's no difference. So, whatever profile you get has to be particle hole symmetry. And the only way is half. So, of course, this is in the extreme of very large fields, but otherwise it's like a Fermi function, you know, in real space. Okay. So then based on that, what you expect is that the current will be small, e to the minus L over LG, but there'll be a factor half that comes in because of this half filling up to there. It's half L divided by LG. Okay. So this was, okay. In order to get this, we assumed a sort of mean field uh, sort of, uh, what should I say, uh, distribution of particles. Although here, once you have this halfway, this is very clear. Anyway, it turns out Martin Evans was visiting TF roughly at that time, and we got interested in this result. And he and his collaborators, Blythe and uh, Francesco Calori and Esler, later, took this problem up and solved it. And here's the, the answer in the case of general alpha beta. So they, they have the coefficients here. And but this leading dependence on G is exactly as you know one thinks it should be from the particle hole symmetry argument. Okay. Hmm. 14 has, was it 14? Has now become six. Okay, I'm keeping an eye. All right. Okay, but now let's think again. So let's say the branches are full. Okay, they're not important at the moment. We'll come back to branches. We remove them from our thinking. So the current has to flow through the backbone. Now, much depends on whether or not you're above the directed percolation con concent uh, uh, concentration, because if you are above PD, which is the directed percolation threshold. There are straight paths which go from up to down, and particles have no problem just going down. You know, th there'll be backbends here and there. Okay, those guys will make it slowly, but these guys just go. But what if you're not that large in P? You could be above PC, but smaller than the directed percolation threshold. So there are no straight paths from up to down. 
So then, you know, for a while we thought, okay, then we can take the shortest paths. That turned out to be a bad idea, you know, because the shortest paths also have back bends, which go backward and roughly distributed the same way. So no good. You need a better idea. And the correct way to think about it is in terms of these B paths. So the B path is defined like this. So take an integer B, okay? And on a B path, no backbend is larger than B, okay? So that's all. It's not, not, nothing very fancy. Now, so for any P in the range PC to PD, there'll be a B star, which depends on P, which is the minimum B for which you have a path of this sort. Like if it's two, then there are paths which, you know, you can go from up to down with back bends of at most length two, which means you can estimate the time because you know the activation time over a barrier of size two. So this is the way you can argue and you can, it's not an exact solution for the time, but you can get a pretty good estimate of how the time goes. So this B star, of course, will be zero if P is bigger than PD, and it will diverge as you go to PC. And we worked out some things on how it diverges and so on in, in, in a paper there long ago. But now let's come back to the branches. So like we said, the branches are full, more or less, they're screened. So the particles coming along the backbone won't really get into the branches. Okay, be that as it may. In a branch, since the current is zero, it's very easy to actually find the exact steady state. You know, because you know the potential and you can just do it, detail balance holes, and you can just find it. So you can put in a, a ordinary statistical mechanics to work and you find the answers that are given here. So basically you can find the full density profile shown in blue for various values of the bias here. And uh, it's, okay, so the setup is like this. Here's, here's a backbone, here's a branch, and there's a profile of uh, the density. And basically you see the density has reached one after some time. There's a certain length lambda, which we call lambda. You can find it approximately, let's give it here. Where the, you know, it may be if the bias is low, that you don't have that many particles. You have to go quite deep in order to fill. So there is a new length that comes in, and that's the length after which the density is more or less one. But there's a lambda that comes in. Okay, now. So, uh, yeah, okay. Well, so let me proceed. Yeah. So in some sense, the branches are innocuous. I mean, the screen, they don't do anything. But just imagine a particle going around and around a ring with maybe only one branch. Once in a while, that branch will empty out. So if it empties out, the particle will nicely go in. But having gone in, it will take forever to get out because not only is it activation, but all the others have to activate out before it can go. So how long will that take? So you can estimate that. You can estimate it very easily through the ratio of two partition functions. One is the normal equilibrium partition function and one is when you constrain it to be empty because it needs an empty branch to get out. And the ratio will give you more or less the inverse time of the time. And that time, well, um, so if your branch length is quite small, then it's the old answer, e to the L O L G. But if your branch is big, this time is e raised to L squared over 2 L G. Why L squared? Kramer's again. e raised to V over KT. But what is V? V has all these particles lined up. It's the integral of MGH between zero and L. Integral of MGH is H squared by two. So that's why it's L squared by two. This is an awfully long time. I mean, you know, okay. 
We note that it's a very long time. But we proceed. Oh, okay, I should have pointed out some things here. Yeah, so these are sort of numerical tests of these formulae. And you can see that as you change the branch length from five to six to seven, you get quite rapid increases in the um, times. And if you scale by the, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm at your disposal, but if I could, I okay, thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll, I will, okay. Um, okay, so given all this, suppose you just do a numerical experiment, you have a ring with 100 sites and one branch. Okay, and you just send particles round and round, and you take some other point and you see how long it takes to cover that time, uh, I mean, that distance, and uh, you plot the probability of the time taken to cover that distance versus time, and it's surely enough peaked around 700, which is the uh, value predicted from the uh, velocity, but you can see this tail. Now we can amplify the tail by taking log, putting it on a log scale. And then you see all sorts of interesting structure. And in fact, this last point is this branch emptying out time. So very rarely it did encounter the branch, went in and it came out. This plateau is this, when it was not at the bottom, but sec second and so on. So there is an effect of some sort from the e to the l squared by rare though it is. Okay, right. Uh, okay, this is just to show you that the, this is indeed matching with the emptying out times. These are transit times, these are emptying out times, this is dominated by the empty. These are branch lengths. Yeah, they're very, Modest lens. Right. Uh, okay, am I over? Oh, the last point I wanted to say. So, therefore, if you imagine the motion of a tagged particle, which is doing its rounds around the ring, and you just plot its uh, distance moved, well, it will be moving steadily, and then it will stop when it goes into the ring. And it will stay there for a very, 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 very long time and then resume. So it's intermittent. The probability of this happening is very low, but when it happens, it's very low. What is the word? black swan? Maybe it's one of these black swans, right? That, that happens and sort of, okay. Uh, so we expect strongly intermittent trajectories with infrequent, but very large breaks. And I hope this is the end. Yeah, okay. So there are the conclusions, well, uh, Drift trapping go against each other, and there are interesting effects when you put in exclusion. Okay, that's all I'd like to say right now. So, we have time for a few questions. This non monotonic drift velocity uh, is there a I mean, can you think of some experiment or actual situation where one can see something like that? Yes. Uh, so actually, when we first did the work, we tried to look up uh, some literature and we found these books on chromatographs, you know, gel chr chromatographs. And uh, this is like a field. And uh, people do see non monotonicities but they often ascribe it to particles being very big and they can't get through pores. But so I, uh, th that was in 1980s. Uh, in the meantime, I don't know of new experiments, which were, I feel it will be very nice if a small systematic experiment is done to either verify or disprove this. Hmm? Yes, yes, that's right. Th 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 this is right, this is what, you should do. <laughs> right. Sorry. Okay. So, with the interactions, you had this uh, the backbends have like resistances which uh, grow exponentially with 
the size, right, of the yeah, back so, bends. So can you repeat with so interactions? With what? interactions, so you have this, uh, uh, the back bends have yeah. resistances which are which grow exponentially. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then you have a distribution of this which is also exponential in here. Yes. So the yes. final. Uh, there will be a. That, oh, so what do you get for the final, uh, the current versus the field? Well, you get a finite uh, current. Oh, so it, it depends on which model we're talking about. I mean, you know, there's one model in which you just take a path, any old path, and then you get backbends of all lengths, and then you get V versus G exactly like in the branch. I mean, with, with branches, zero. Okay. So I mean, yeah, no, no, no. This is without interaction. Okay. But, but uh, yeah, so again, no, so, sorry, so again, if you have a distribution of uh, these, then you will get zero. If you have a distribution of backbend lens, but I'm arguing that in the percolation cluster, there are other parts where the backbend length is strictly bounded, and then you get a non-zero. Uh, I mean, should I draw something? I don't know. Uh, so here are these sort of favored parts which have small backbends. On the other hand, there are other parts which go ahead and uh, there are also larger backbends, and, but these are in parallel. And so, you know, something like this will stop the flow, but there, there is a finite backbone made of these small backbend uh, parts. So, so these can easily carry the current. And so my claim is that there's a network of these and this will carry the current. So then it doesn't vanish. Well, somewhere I had a plot also of the uh, thing, but I, I forgot to show. So, so it doesn't vanish except at g equal to one. So the velocity looks like this. At extreme bias it vanishes. Because if g is one, then it cannot overcome even a tiny backbend. Thank you. Okay, so it's time. To, uh, Thank you.